In this video, I'm gonna show you a bunch of tricks and tips to make beautiful LaTeX documents. I've actually made a whole playlist introducing LaTeX from the very beginning, all sorts of features, but this video is really focused on the tips to make your documents beautiful. Now, before we get into it, I just wanted to quickly mention that the sponsor of this entire playlist on LaTeX has been Overleaf, which is a fantastic LaTeX editor. And for the very first time, we're actually running a promotion in this video. There is 10% off an annual either student or standard plan. So go to the link in the description and get your discount for that. My thank you to Overly for just being such a wonderful partner in this LaTeX journey. All right, to the tips and tricks. My first trick is multiple different types of ways to put things side by side and have columns in your document. I'm gonna begin by generating some random text with the Lipsum package. If you want your entire document to be columns, then I can do this by going up to the document class and putting two column as a parameter. This is gonna set the entire document having two columns, which is often how academic publishers are gonna have their papers published. You can always come and write one column at some point in your document if you wanna convert it from two columns, which is the default, back down to one column for everything after the one column. But maybe you just want columns to appear in one particular portion. For this, I use the multi-call package for multiple columns. I'm gonna go begin multi-calls to start my section of multiple columns. And then in squiggly brackets, I'm gonna put two, which means that I'm gonna have two columns. I then can put in square brackets, some like header text, like just some long sentence that's gonna spread over the top of the two columns. Then let's do our lip sum again with paragraphs one to five, just to generate a whole bunch of text. And we're gonna end our multi-calls. And let's see what that looks like. So what we see on our second page here is this initial sentence that was the stuff in square brackets that goes over both columns. And then I have the two different columns. They are currently spaced so that they're gonna be exactly the same height. If I came and put an asterisk behind it, it would fill out the page with the first column and only then start wrapping to the second column. You see that it's sort of an uneven way that the first goes all the way to the bottom and only then does it start wrapping. The third way to sort of make two columns to put things side by side is to use something called mini page. Mini page is kind of what it sounds like. It allows you to make an entire LaTeX page sort of miniature. You could put two pages, for example, side by side and then do whatever you would want to in a normal page. Very similar structure. I'm gonna go begin mini page. Is you can put in the square brackets things like the width that you want the different columns to be. Uh, for instance, imagine the first column is gonna be a bit bigger. It is gonna be 0 0.6 times the text width. So basically what you're saying is you have 100% of the width of the text where text would normally go, 60% of this is gonna be the first page. How about some more lip sum text? Let's just do uh, the first paragraph. Then I'm gonna go and do end. And by the way, I wanted to point out one quick overly feature, which is that it automatically is gonna suggest what options are gonna be. It sees that the things that could be closed right now are mini page and document. So this just sort of helps to speed up the, uh, the, the closing of all of the uh, environments that you create. Anyways, I've done one that was gonna be 0.6 the text width. Then let me do another one, and I'm gonna make this one 0.3, and the idea is these are gonna be beside each other. Right now, this is gonna put the two columns like right, right, right beside each other, and so I'm just gonna give a tiny little bit of horizontal space with H space. We're gonna talk a little bit more about this in a moment. I'm gonna give it a width of how about 10 points, and let's execute and see what we get. We've got this paragraph that's typed out twice. It's done in two different side-by-side -side pages. The one was 60%, then there was that small little bit of uh, horizontal space and then the other one in 30%. And you can put anything in these pages, tables, images, whatever you like. For example, let me upload a couple images. There, I've added my two images on the left-hand side. We can hide this again. And so this time, instead of putting the generic text, let's come and put in include graphics. One was PMG, I believe. And let's take a look at what this does. There you can see, I've got my two graphics. In both cases, I've added the command that the width of my graphic is the width of the line. So in my pages, the, the one that was 60% looks bigger than the one that was smaller percent. But maybe you don't like that and you can shrink them both down to the same size, or whatever you like. But mini page in general is able to put any non-floating object inside of those mini pages. And it can be really powerful. Now, one of the things to adjust the overall look and feel of your documents is about the margins. 
You'll notice there's all of this space surrounding my documents. And what if I want to tweak that? For this, I'm going to use the geometry package. You can visualize a page in LaTeX looking like this. There's the body of the image, but there's a whole bunch of other things around this. Headers, footers, margins, little bits of space. With that geometry package, you can adjust every one of these numbers. I actually have this, I have this overleaf reference document book parked on my computer. I'll put a link down in the description. So if I ever want to tweak something, I know precisely what the command that I want to tweak is. To illustrate the point, I'm going to do four of these. And I'm going to set the length of the horizontal and vertical offsets. Those are going to be the margins. And I've set them to be minus one inch so that they take the default of one inch and then subtract one to have no margins at all. I'm also going to set this tiny little gap to be zero and this margin node on the right hand side, I'm going to set that to the value 1.5 inches. I'll tell you why in a moment. But here's the point. I just played around with some of the parameters and now my document looks like this. Maybe less beautiful than how I began in contradiction to my title. But the point is you can play around with any of these. I'm actually going to remove the original two column classification so that this is just one column. And the reason I've left this oversized margin over here is I want to tell you about margin nodes. A margin node is something like this, something you put off on the side, something that you put into margins. I've talked in previous videos about putting footnotes at the bottom. This is a margin note. And what I've done is I've just copy and pasted this big block of text. But the point is that you use this command margin par for a paragraph and whatever you put in there is going to be in the margin at whatever place this is in this text. So this particular place it would look like consequat and at the same height as consequat over on the margin that's where that's going to be. Let's use the overleaf command control slash to hide all of those rather silly conditions so that our document looks a little bit more normal for the rest of the video. Next up I want to talk about white space. Here I have some differential equation. I've put it in here I have some differential equation with two different initial conditions and it just looks awful because if I look at where these commas are, there's no spaces there. In the original equation, I mean, I typed a space, but here's the thing, when you're in math mode, LaTeX is going to ignore spaces. So I can do several things to deal with the spacing. The first thing I can do is use backslash space. So it's a backslash with a space afterwards. That and that does exactly what you think it is. It's actually going to input a single space there. Looks a little bit nicer for sure. But I can do more because already maybe I want my spacing to be a little bit larger. And I could copy and paste that like four times to get four spaces. But a command that I use all the time is quad, which basically gives four spaces or I can do even larger with Q quad. How I love random LaTeX terminology. But the point is, that now the spaces are larger and then larger again. And these are standardized, so like I use quad all the time, so I have this consistent look and feel throughout my document. If you really want to specify it, instead what you could do was H space, which we've talked about before, and let's use one inch now as the amount of space. And I'm gonna put it there, and I'm gonna put it where my Q quad was. Let's put both of those in. And now I should have really nice spacing between these. You can use H space in or outside of math mode, but when you're outside of math mode, another one I really like is H fill. So how about this? This is some text and then I use H fill and what H fill does is it fills white space until the far end of the line with whatever you've got on the right hand side. So this is some other stuff. Basically what it's going to do is going to take those two things and put them to opposite sides of my document. This is some text on the left, then it fills up all the available space. This is some text on the right. And HFill is really nice because you can use it multiple times with multiple objects and it will nicely distribute everything with whatever the amount of space is so everything's evenly spaced. You can do basically the same thing with VFill and VSpace. Like for example, if I do VSpace, how about one inch and this is some more text, let's see what happens. Then it gives this nice one inch break. And if instead I wanted to sort of automatically adjust the way HFill did, let me give a new page at the end of this so we know that's going to be an N. And then I'm going to write V fill and this is going to fill up all of the space until you get the final text before the new page. This is some text, a lot of empty space. Then at the very final line, this is some more text and then you get the new page. Let's talk about line grates and paragraph spacing. Let me write a paragraph. If I just do a single enter and write this is a second paragraph, well, LaTeX ignores that. As you see, it just goes, this is a paragraph and then this is a second paragraph. However, if I came here and had 
two enters between them, now it's going to interpret it as a full return. This is a paragraph, this is a second paragraph. And that's sort of it. If I do a whole bunch of enters, all of this extra stuff, it's just white space in the code, and LaTeX is going to ignore all of it. This is a paragraph, this is a second paragraph. Now, I might also want to do a line break. A line break is, let's not call it a second paragraph. I'm going to do double backslash. This is going to break the line and send it back down to the start of the next line. This is a new line. And I say new line here because it is not a new paragraph. When I come here, I get this new line down here, but notice it does not have an annotation. Uh, LaTeX is defaulting here to give a new paragraph, the start of it, a natural indent. By the way, if you want to get rid of that natural indent, you can come here and write no indent. Now they're aligned. But the point is that they are not new paragraphs as it was when you did a double enter. You can sort of do something a little bit hacky, which is that you can go and do a line break and then you can do the enter and it creates this new spaced line here. I see this a lot, but I can show you actually a better way to deal with, if you want separation between your paragraphs, so you're not always having to do this sort of hacky trick. To do this, I'm gonna go up to the top and I'm gonna make a new package. This is the par skip package and I can send it various parameters. One thing is I can tell you what the amount of skip is between one paragraph and the next, which here I will set at 20 points. You could also say, well, how much of an indent am I going to have? I was telling you that new paragraphs automatically are indented. And you can see what this does. These paragraphs have this separation of 20 point, and all of these indents are going to be 40 points. I actually often like setting my indent to zero. When I've got lots of paragraphs, I like indents, but when it's lots of like equation, a sentence, equation, a sentence, the indents seem to be a little bit messy, at least to my eyes, and so I often set my indents to zero. Next up, I want to show you how you can annotate equations. So I have two different equations here. When I'm writing solutions to students as opposed to a polished paper, I kind of want to like point at different things in the equation to talk about them. A few tricks. One thing I can do is underbrace. So let me come down to this initial condition. I can go backslash underbrace, and I can select a portion of the text and then I can put down here whatever I want to have. How about this is an initial uh, condition? Compile that, and I have this nice underbrace around a portion of it. I might also want to do some highlighting. So, for example, at the top, I will add the T color box package. And then at this particular place, I can go backslash color box. Let's make it how about yellow? That always seems nice. And then I put the Y of S inside of the box. And actually, I want to have a special box here, so I need to put it in math mode, even though it's in the middle of a box. Oh, apparently I have an error because I don't know how to spell the word box. And there it is, we have this nice highlighting. And then the coolest one is just this awesome package that I found a while back called with arrows. And it just lets you put arrows all over your equations. Instead of having a line, which is sort of a standard way of aligning equations, I'm gonna go with arrows, and I'm gonna end with arrows as well. I also have to make it in my math display mode, so I'm going to add this in. And now it's going to have not done anything. It's just basically mimicked the AMS uh, align package so far. Now I can do something new. I'm going to go backslash arrow. And there's many different types of arrows here, but I'll just go for the default. And then I can put in some text beside it, like take the Laplace transform. That's what's going to go beside my arrow. And then compiling, I get this really nifty arrow that explains if I'm going from one equation to the other equation, I'm going to take the Laplace transform. And there's all sorts of arrows that you can do in this particular package. You can add lots of options, like I can with arrow options, and you can put stuff in, like the one I'll do here is I'll make it blue. And now I get a blue arrow pointing down. And between these different features, you can just make your equations sort of come alive where you're able to explain what you're doing at the different parts of your equations. This next latest package is useful for anybody who codes. I'm going to add a new package called Minted. And then in my document, I'm going to write Begin Minted. And what you can put in is whatever the language of your code is. So I'm going to do Python in my example. And then I'm going to copy and paste just a bunch of Python code. It doesn't matter what it does. In previous videos, I've talked about using the verbatim package, which is just going to put this into some nice box. But I would actually prefer that it understands Python and color codes it appropriately, which is what Minton's going to do. So let's get to the end of this, and then I'm going to go and do end uh, Minted. And if I compile this, I'm going to get my Python code interpreted as Python and color coded as Python code. 
this dramatically improves readability. This is just like how in the code section for Overleaf, they're coming along and they're color coding whatever it is that we're writing. You can actually treat these the same way you might put figures or tables or any other types of things. For example, I could do begin a listing. I often like to put uh, the H in parameters to say that I'm gonna be doing it here and let's do an end listing. So this is gonna start just enumerating the thing that I have and, and now I can give it stuff like, for example, a caption, same way you might capture in a figure environment. I'm gonna give it a caption. Uh, this is some Python code. Oh, apparently I don't know how to spell the word caption. Let's put a P there. And now we get some nice enumeration and this caption underneath it. This is also gonna enumerate them. You could give it a reference label to be able to refer to it. You could make a list of all of your listing somewhere. All the things that you could do with figures or tables can be done here as well. The last thing I want to show you is about using templates. So I've been manipulating in my document, but let's start an entirely new document. I'm gonna go up and do new project. If I click new project, there's some generic templates right off the bat, but let's go view all just to see how many there are. And the real point is that when you're working in LaTeX, it can take quite a while to be doing like what I've been doing in this video, figure out everything you want with margins and style and set it up beautifully. And I often recommend not to start from scratch. For example, I've never made a video on doing resumes. Uh, maybe I will one day, but right now you can just come here and you can look at all the possible different resume templates that different people have put in. And so you just choose any of these templates and now you've got the basic structures to adapt your document from there. Now, throughout this video, I have been using Overleaf as my LaTeX editor. Overleaf has been the sponsor of this entire series on LaTeX and they've been a fantastic partner. And for the first time, we are offering a 10% discount to my subscribers and only my subscribers if you click the link down in the description to get 10% off either an annual student or annual standard plan. Well, I'm actually a really big fan of Overleaf's entirely free option. They give a lot away for free. The paid version just have a lot of quality of life features. They're great for like document history and tracking your changes, collaborating with your peers, integration with different reference managers, there's so many little quality of life features for doing the upgrade to the paid version. This promo runs until the end of May, 2023. So click the link down in the description if you're so interested. If you have any questions or thoughts about LaTeX, put those down in the comments. We're gonna get back to some more math in the next video.